Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours, the webcast in which I go through your top voted SQL server and Azure SQL DB questions give you answers that sometimes you don't want to hear. Now, oh, it's the perfect time of year in Las Vegas. It's got this nice, the evenings have this nice, crisp, cool air coming through. Um, I actually get to wear my hoodies and jeans in the morning when I walk the dog. It's just absolutely fantastic. You get, you never, even in the depths of winter in Vegas, it almost never snows here. It did like two or three years ago, uh, but almost never snows here. If you go like 40 minutes west of here, you get snow up in the mountains in Mount Charleston. I've done a, a stream from up there during the summer. I haven't done one yet during the winter. I really need to do that. So let's go through your top voted questions and see what's going on here. The top voted question is from Ilian who asks, Hello Brent, I'm on SQL Server 2019. Which should I patch? Should I put on the latest CU plus a security update or should I only put on the latest security update? This was such a big question for such a long time and I was so frustrated that Microsoft didn't have clear advice on it that I built a site called SQLServerUpdates.com. SQLServerUpdates.com, right there on the home page. It tells you here are exactly the updates that you should apply and the order in which you should apply them. I make it really easy for you. Just go to SQLServerUpdates.com and follow the instructions right there on the screen. Super simple. Um, every now and then I feel like I'm, uh, like if somebody would have read the question, they would have been like, Brent put that question in for, on purpose to like promote something. No, that I had the same problems that y'all did. I had those same problems where clients would ask me all the time, you know, what patch should I apply? What patch do you recommend uh, that I apply? I recommend that you should go on the current patch. Go as, as new as you possibly can because I know how y'all work. You don't patch that often. <laughs> You only patch like every three months or every six months. So when you're going to do it, you might as well be on the latest one because they fix really serious bugs. Uh, in 2022, I believe, as, as of this recording, the most recent CU fixed corruption problems, database corruption issues. You think that there can't be any more of those in the year 2025, and they, they still keep coming. I'm not saying that the product's bad. The product is good. They keep aggressively finding and fixing things, especially that are tied to newer features. Uh, the more new features that you use, especially in combination with each other, the more likely you are to hit those kinds of edge case bugs. Uh, but I applaud Microsoft for not only fixing them, but also being transparent uh, when they find them and fix them. Like here are the things that we did. Uh, next up we have DBA architect or DB architect chick who says, Brent, I'm trying, I'm struggling to solve this problem in my head. I love stored procedures. I wrote a robust unit, unit testing suite for them. Unfortunately, my fellow application developers call them code smell. Should I give up on pressing for stored procedures? Here's a way that I think of it. When you have more developers than you have database administrators, it's usually easier to keep the queries inside code. When you have more DBAs than you have developers, or when you just have a glut of DBAs that have time on their hands, it can be easier to put the code in stored procedures because then when things go wrong, the DBAs can fix the stored procedures without requiring a redeployment of the application. Most of the shops I work with, though, uh, there are many more developers. There are very few DBAs, and those DBAs tend to be very pressed for time. Uh, so in those cases, it usually makes more sense to keep the code in, uh, in inside the application. Um, uh, there are other use cases where it makes sense to put them in stored procedures too. When you have a lot of applications, maybe you have an API, you have an old web front end, you have a new web front end, you have a thick client, you got all these different things, and you want to make one set of queries that everyone else can call uh, and that they don't have to worry about reinventing the wheel, then stored procedures can make sense. What I would say, though, is probably if the rest of your team doesn't like stored procedures, ask what's the problem that I'm trying to solve by using stored procedures. Stored procs can absolutely solve real problems like repeatable testability. Uh, but if you're not, if the rest of the team isn't trying to solve those problems, I worry about you being the last person like over in a corner crying with, you know, trying to defend yourself. Go look at what the rest of the company needs you to do. I love stored procedures. I absolutely love them. But 
I, I don't, it's extremely rare that I tell clients the thing that I need you to do is stop doing uh, regular code in your app and start moving to store procedures. What I do instead is if somebody's complaining about the performance of a query, what I'll say is here, I rewrote the query. I can't fix it. It's an entity framework. Uh, Dapper wrote this. Uh, Java wrote this with an hibernate and I can't change it. Okay, no problem. I'm going to rewrite it for you. I'm going to rewrite it for you in a way that goes really fast. I'm going to publish it as a stored procedure. Here's how to call a stored procedure in your chosen development language. Not that I know it off heart. I'm just going to link them to whatever their documentation is. Here's how quick it goes. I'm going to record a little animated GIF of me running it or a movie, whichever you prefer. Here, if you want it to go faster, and I'm going to copy their manager, if you want it to go faster, I've done the work for you. Here, just call it from this stored procedure. And then that way it's more of a carrot uh, uh, incentive instead of a stick incentive. L. Wood says, what are the top issues you see when running SQL Server on VMs with multiple NUMA nodes and high core counts? That is so funny because I hit it today with a client. Um, by far and away, it's misconfiguration of the VM, like they don't match up the number of sockets and cores in a way that works well for VMware and Hyper-V to do CPU and memory allocation at the host level. Um, when you get to the point where you're, you, you're the only VM on the host, where the VM is so big that you can't run any other guests on that host, the first thing that I'll say is, you know, it's probably time you should be running bare metal. Start running bare metal with a failover cluster instead of uh, using dedicating one VM per host. Because usually when the app is that big, when the database server is that big, people usually want high availability and they want it to protect them even when a SQL or Windows patch fails, which virtualization does not. The virtualization, you're looking at rolling back to a previous snapshot, and that's not high availability. That's going to take some time for a meatbag human to get involved to pull the trigger on rolling back to a previous version. You're talking about tens of minutes worth of downtime to make that decision before you're back online. Whereas with a bare metal failover cluster, 60 seconds. You know, you patch the, uh, the secondary, make sure the patch works okay, fail over to it, and you have one 60-second outage, and that's it. And even 60 seconds is on the high side. Um, so as your servers become that large, that kind of high availability becomes more important, and that's generally when folks start moving towards bare metal. Um, the, the, it buys you a lot of things, like the ability to put TempDB on local solid state, which you can do with the VM, but then you can't move it rapidly from one host to another because the TempDB is on local storage. That VM won't vMotion or live migrate around. Um, so again, that's where in typically in large applications, large databases, heavy concurrency, that's where you need super fast uh, TempDB access and where you end up uh, switching over towards bare metal. If I had to pick a number, uh, I'd say it's probably like in the neighborhood of 32 to 48 cores. At 38 to 42, 32 to 48 cores, or if you're the only VM on the host, that's when you should probably rethink the virtualization strategy for just that one SQL Server. Uh, next up, let's see, Adrian asks, oh, I got to refresh poll gab here because it's not logged in anymore because I took a little too much time because I love that question. I'm not, I, I was going to go further on that question. Adrian says, I saw, old, I saw code that wasn't mine that purges old data using a with read past hint um, and names on several other hints. I want to know if this is safe, a good idea, or better options. What you want to do is, because he says where we're deleting uh, uh, data, what you want to do is Google for Brent Ozar how to delete some rows from a really big table. And in there, I explain the fast ordered deletes technique that I did not come up with it. So I assume somebody from Microsoft came up with it. They blogged about it. I say they, someone, someone unknown at Microsoft blogged about it like 20 years ago. And then Microsoft has this thing where every couple of years they like to throw all their URLs up in the air and watch them scatter around and see how many of them break. They like move them around like a shell game, moving them between different websites and domain names. And then they go, ah, why can't you find anything? 
So this was one of those posts that got shuffled around and disappeared, and I always like to point people to it. I, it's lost in the sands of time. So now I just have it on my site. So if you go to brentozar.com and search for, or go to Google, search for brentozar, how to delete some rows from a really big table, you don't need those hints at all, and I show you how to do it. Uh, next up, Stit DBA says, in the past, there was a good rule of thumb to wait for Service Pack 1 before migrating to a new version of SQL Server. Stit, I'm going to tell you, that means that like me, you are old because there haven't been Service Packs for SQL Server in at least 10 years, at least. He says, with Service Packs now a thing of the past, what general guidance would you offer for a time to migrate to a new version? Um, the only time that you should move to a new version, I actually blog about, if you search for uh, Bren Ozar, which version of SQL Server should I install? And I'm going to give you the short version of it. You should only go to the newest version of SQL Server if you specifically need something from it. Not that you want something from it, but that you need something from it in order to survive in production. Otherwise, I would usually stay one version behind. Now, Microsoft doesn't like to hear that, but Microsoft also doesn't like to hire quality assurance people. When Satya Nadella took over, one of the things that he did was decimate all the quality assurance teams, and he just said, from now on, developers are responsible for doing their own testing. And you can see that in code quality. Code quality for SQL Server went, and many Microsoft products, went radically downhill at that time. Um, the, I'm, I'm not saying that it's you know absolutely terrible, but I wouldn't go to a new version unless you genuinely need something from it. Otherwise, just let it continue to bake. Next up, Brent Fanboy says, Hi Brent, I have a server that is under heavy load and I need to catch a stored procedure that runs very fast. Unfortunately, it does updates and deletes, so I can't run it myself. What's the best way of caching query plans and runtime stats for that stored procedure? So here's the thing, you've asked that same question a few different ways in recent rounds, and I'm guessing that you haven't liked the answer that I've given you. One thing that I could do is I could give you the same answer again. You don't seem to be listening, you seem to be trying to reword it in subtle ways to get me to change my answer. I could lose my cool, I could give a rant here or whatever. But instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'd like you to look inside you. I have given you answers, and I've even asked you what the problem is that you're trying to solve, and you're still trying to badger me into giving the answer that you want. It feels like you want me to say use profiler or use extended events. I don't recommend doing that for a query that runs very fast. Why are you trying to catch query plans for a query that runs very fast and by everything that you're describing doesn't run very often? Like you're like, it's a mystery. Who cares? Let it go. Why are you trying to do that? If you were my junior DBA, I would pull the door closed behind you and I'd say, here, look, sit down for a second. What's the biggest problem that users are complaining about right now? If you have a query that runs very fast, that tells me also they're not complaining about it. People might be complaining about you, about your inability to step back and ask users, what is it that you're facing that I can help you with? What is it that you're upset about? It sounds like you're dead set on doing something for learning or educational purposes. If you want to do something for learning or educational purposes, that's cool. Go run experiments to find it out in a development environment. But stop asking that question. Start asking yourself questions about why you're doing this and why you're not taking advice from someone who's willing to give it to you for free in their own time. I'm trying to help you. Help me help you. Uh, next up, let's see, Harold asks, so I got to reset poll gab again here because I went too long on that. I should probably set my phone when I start this. I should set my phone so it doesn't time out so quickly. Um, Harold says, hi, Brent. Is there a way in SQL Server where I can call stored procedures in asynchronous mode, i.e., I've got a parent stored procedure 
which has a couple of other store procedures it needs to execute. Right now it's going subsequently. Is there a way that I can get them all started together? So I'm going to give you two answers. One is the book answer. The book answer says you shouldn't be doing that because error handling won't work. What happens if one of the stored procedures breaks and the other ones are still trucking along? SQL Server doesn't have any kind of good error handling for that. It wouldn't be able to do things like transactions, stuff like that. So the book answer would be if you want to do multiple things that don't need error handling at the same time, build an app, do something in C Sharp, in Python, in Java, where you can go off and spawn multiple threads uh, and do your own error gathering and error handling for each of those independently. That's the book answer. Now I'm going to give you the non-book answer. The non-book answer is if you need to kick off a thread and do something else in SQL Server, you shouldn't ever do this in production, but it's such a fun answer. Write code that builds a SQL agent job. So you can have a SQL agent job. It's way easier than it sounds. You can write code to create a SQL agent job if it doesn't exist. You're going to want to use consistent naming here and be smart about that. You're going to set it up to, to uh, only run once, and as part of its uh, job running, you're going to want to delete the job. And then after you create the job, you're going to want to start the job. Now, it's going to go soldier off on its own. It may fail. Uh, there's not going to be any kind of error handling that will go back and call the parent. But if you want to do that, that's one way to do it. Have I ever done that in production? Yes, for utility type stuff. Um, there was a time where I needed to multi-thread restores where I needed to restore multiple databases simultaneously in the event of disaster, and I could get faster performance by restoring multiple databases at the same time. And the way that I did that was write a script that would spawn off agent jobs. I think I've done that in another case, and I don't remember what it was. But uh, anyway, there you go. I thought it was fun, so I'd share it with you. Boy, we timed that pretty perfectly, didn't we, in terms of the light? The light just looks delightful out here. I am probably going to go in and go get myself some marshmallows and some uh, chocolate bars and graham crackers and go make myself some s'mores. So hope that y'all had fun and learned something, and I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.